Hi, everyone. How are you feeling? Come on, give me some energy. <laughs> Had at least one coffee by now. <laughs> Um, I am so excited to be here and do this panel. Um, I don't want to take up too much space, but I guess if I introduce myself first and foremost. So my name is Chloe Davies. Um, I am the founder of It Takes a Village, which is a collective for black women in advertising, media, and marketing. Um, I feel like this panel is very much for me too, because I'm just new and I just got this side inside. So um, I was at Lucky Generals for two years. I helped create Virgin Atlantic, Amazon, and a whole host of other incredible adverts. Um, and I've been client side for about 20 years and now kind of went in-house. So uh, the rules are different. I didn't come from traditional marketing and I think that's also why I got put to host <laughs> this panel of some absolute powerhouses um, and dynamic people. I'm so excited for the conversation that we're gonna have because we are absolutely gonna go in. Um, and really talk about what does it mean to be a young creative? What's the definition of young for our community? But also let's just break down some of the work and some of the barriers. Um, so I am gonna let my amazing panel introduce themselves, tell you where they came from and how they got into this amazing thing we call the creative industry. So, Madeleine. Amazing, thanks. Yeah, I'm Madeleine Dowd, but please, if you bump into me, call me Maddie. Um, I currently work with the Helen Hamlin Center as a creative researcher, but also have got two other companies, one CEO of and the other one director of. Um, I'm a blonde white female and currently wearing some extravagant, almost scientific coat right now. Um, but for me, my background's really in disaster resilience design. So I get sent around the world to disaster zones to develop solutions, whether that's looking at services, products, architectures, recently working over in Poland to help with the Ukraine war, as well as going over to Japan, developing architectures for tsunamis. But I'm a school dropout. The system didn't work for me. <laughs> and I'm now working within a curriculum design and I'm supporting new curriculums to help creatives in being empowered at earlier stages to be able to get to places like this. So that's a little bit about me. Hi everyone, I'm Shiva Raichandani. I am a brown South Asian non-binary person wearing a colorful green and orange top and some brown trousers and black shoes. I'm um, very excited to be in the company of all of you. Thank you so much for having us. Um, I am by profession a creative consultant working in entertainment, in film and television. I direct films, hopefully will be directing TV very soon. And I'm at this weird intersection of new and digital media and traditional media where I actually started out online and I'm going into traditional media, so like the reverse. Um, so I started out making videos on YouTube, as one usually does on <laughs> back in that day when YouTube was a big thing. Well, YouTube is still a big thing, but back then it was the only avenue where we were like, we're gonna be YouTubers. Um, I used to upload dance videos. My background's um, a professional dancer. I trained in Indian classical dance and used to just love uploading dance videos off of my basement. Um, that translated to a, an Instagram following and an Instagram profile through which I shared more of dance work that led me to Britain's Got Talent, being a semi-finalist, so from the social media platform to stage, which then I had a midlife pivot and <laughs> went into <laughs> filmmaking, but built my film career off of Instagram that led to TikTok, that led to creating movies for Netflix, Sky TV, and a BAFTA-nominated film recently. So it's sort of like a weird <laughs> mix. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rissy. I'm also non-binary. And I'm currently wearing a sand color gilet, white t-shirt, and sand color trousers. I'm also a college dropout. Um, and after I dropped out in school, I went into fashion for about four years as a garment technologist. And then dropped out of that again um, and stepped into the world of advertising. And so I'm currently a strategist um, in a social media agency. But I'm also on top of that, I've got Collective, which helps um, give juniors in advertising a platform to have a voice, to have their say, to give their raw opinion, 
And on top of that as well, I'm also a trustee at DNA D. So yeah, it's me. Thank you. Um, and I actually didn't do, I have, I'm a black, dark-skinned woman. Um, I have short, I'm in my 60s era, I've got short bob. I'm wearing a blue and white striped top and a bright blue skirt. And I've got orange stilettos on. Um, it, I, I really love the dynamic of all the different places that you've come from. And, you know, I've worked in retail, fashion, uh, I'm a chef, um, I run my own company, um, and I did everything outside of the industry and then somehow ended up, ended up in advertising properly uh, two years ago. And I think, Shiva, to your point, when you talked about your journey of coming from socials and then coming to the industry, for our, for our young people, our new young creatives who have so much technology mm. to their arms outside and actually can go and create it for themselves, there's tutorials on YouTube, there's Instagram videos to do all the things that we do inside a traditional industry. Do, do we still believe that actually that path is the path forward into our industry? Um, and is it working? Shiva, I'm going to start with you and what you think. Um, I think it really depends on what kind of content you want to make and where you want it to be. Because depending on that choice, there are certain limitations, barriers, or hoops to traverse. For me, I do not know that I wanted to get into TV, and um, because I didn't come from an arts background or a film school background or any of that official um, sort of credentials that usually people would need to get into traditional industries, I resorted to social media. And social media was such a great avenue for me because it was sort of like the world is your oyster, you can do whatever you want. Obviously within the confines of the platform, because depending on where you are, you could be censored for whatever reason, you have the limits of that platform in itself. And so for me it was really a process of discovery, not just self-discovery, but also discovery of the kind of path I would like to forge for myself. And social media gave that expanse, which was really exciting. And so playing with those tools and teaching myself those tools was fun, but I also realized that not many people our start from a level playing field. Like obviously if your content is good and whatever you're trying to share is engaging, people will still come to it irrespective of what platform it is. But not everyone starts with the same resources or like the funds to even like get into those spaces to create stuff. I didn't have equipment like camera equipment or like sound equipment and those kind of things that even if you were doing on socials, a lot of people have and have the monetary means to have. So it was sort of like battling all of those different things and saying, how can I be creative with whatever tool sets I have and whatever skill sets I can learn and teach myself through these platforms? When I then realized that actually I wanted to be on a larger scale on a sort of like a, a screen that people watch like TV and television, then I realized that an easier way to break into that was leveraging the communities that I created online through my social media platforms to gain the attention of industry people because it w it's hard to get into the people who are gatekeeping the industry, the traditional industry with their mindset and how they don't appreciate, acknowledge, or see the monetary benefit of bringing in diverse storytelling into their spaces. A, because maybe they've not had that exposure, or B, because they haven't taken the risk um, to give us those kinds of opportunities, or there aren't people who look like us in those spaces to give us that opportunity anyway. So social media was a great place because anyone can do whatever you want, and you can find communities there. So for me, that really helped, but I think Traditional media is in some ways trying to play catch up with the social world, which is very weird. I'll give you a very tangible example. So the documentary that I directed for Netflix had its premiere on TikTok, <laughs> which is very weird because we were like, oh, we're gonna have this big Netflix showcase and it's going Netflix, but Netflix that were trying to tap into the social media platform because they knew that was the best way to tap into the younger, new audiences that they don't have, and so they organized the launch on TikTok. So it's trying to see that actually the lines are blurring and there's no set way to approach any of the industries, whether it's new media or traditional media. Awesome. Thank you, and you talked about risk, and Maddie, that's your world, that's where you live. What, is, what, are, what are some of the risks that kind of you see and identify? Are we losing our young people? 
So I feel like there really is gatekeeping that happens. So one of my businesses, uh, Helm Innovation, is to do with maritime safety products, which uh, I developed whilst I was at university by accident, two-week project, and got asked to turn it into a business. It's like, great, as a concept, but the maritime industry is notorious for being 15 years slower than anywhere else. And it's a ridiculous place to be. And I was invited to have meetings with CEOs of other companies and had to bring someone who was a middle-aged white man to sit next to me where the conversation got filtered through. Me being the CEO and decision maker of my company in which they were trying to buy. So there are positions that I've been in which they stated that they didn't trust women. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and it can be so frustrating. It can be so, so frustrating. But I think I really built up a team of advocates to play on the group that were here before people that really wanted to support me in what I was trying to do. And disaster resilience design, it isn't a title that exists and it's why I'm sat here. It's something that is the only way to explain what I do now. Um, But it doesn't mean that it's easy to hold that title, but I'm just constantly pushing myself, hopefully into the right places to be able to support people in their missions, which at the end of the day for me is saving lives. So working with charities, working on short-term projects, and just making myself visible. But I don't sit particularly within kind of the social media forums. A lot of the work that I do, it does have to sit with people that are quite a bit older than me for them to believe in me and my capability, which doesn't involve focusing time on that kind of promotion. I need to be in that room with them and I need to be investing my time in talking with them, which goes back to the old school going for lunches (laughs) and having those business meetings and the building of trust. And that's something that I think if I can ask people to really focus on one thing, it's looking at how you build trust with someone for them to then believe in you to give you those opportunities. I love, I, I love the segueing. Appreciate you both. Um, Rissy, when you uh, think about, you know, from a young perspective, some of the work that's been so groundbreaking that you've been co-creator for is Fax No Printer, that's really looking at juniors being the new seniors and really tapping into a part of the community that, you know, for the work that you've done, some of the brands and campaigns that you've worked on, we've seen around, you know, the nation and actually would we know that they were built and created and strategized by young people at the heart of it? So do you feel that we are as attractive as an industry to um, young talent or where's the disconnect? What are we getting wrong? Uh, My short answer is no. And (laughs) I would say that because I feel like even if it it tries to appear as attractive, it's not accessible and it's not uh, reactive enough in being accessible. And so younger people are going to find something more reactive, whether it's making yourself, finding like-minded uh, creators around you and local communities, especially online, which I think are heightened, especially during the pandemic, but before that, people finding online communities, because if they're not your neighbor or where you're locally working in, in London, et cetera, you can find it in Swansea, et cetera, et cetera, um, and then build it from there. I also feel like a lot of agencies are slow reacting, slow and creative movement, um, very afraid, and very much so living in a, let's see this other brand do it instead, or a small independent company do it, or an individual creator uh, do it, and then let's take their learnings, steal their learnings, etc., and make it our own with a bigger platform and own and dominate. Um, I'm just going to give an example, but I won't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, yeah, I think that the attractiveness has gone down the drain, and like growing up, especially being black in London with parents who immigrated, um, being in advertising wasn't an option. It was like an unreliable career path to go down. So something I always loved, did it in school, but I was like, I knew that I was going to have to park it up and never go back to it. So when I found out that actually this is a career that I can do like 10 years later, I was like, well, someone get me in the door. And I didn't have a laptop at the time either, or any tech stuff, and the entry for my course, which was like, for those who have not been to university at any age, was you have to submit three pieces of work. So um, I was doing 
one of my many side hustles at the time and use makeup artistry to create some graphic pieces on my phone and submitted the three only pieces I've ever made and to this day I'm still here. So, it's quite, so I'm glad I took a win out and uh, a chance on me but I feel like places like that make um, spaces of more accessibility, then it can look more realistically. Then you can be like, oh, is it attractive? I can have it. It's like, for example, if you're allergic to gluten, you're not going to look at something saying, oh, that's, you can't say, oh, it's delightful, but that's not for me anyway. But if you know that actually if there's a gluten-free option, like maybe I want the choice in having it. So, and yeah. I, I love the premise of, you know, the real accessibility of it, mm -hmm. like how you reach, how you can access, how you can navigate through you know, in talking about your careers to date and where you came from and um, did you go to college or didn't you? Fellow university dropout, I was like, <laughs> it's not for me. Um, not because I didn't try, but my very first job, I did work experience at Tower Records in Piccadilly Circus that doesn't exist anymore. I wanted to work in music, started my degree and I was like, oh, no, nope, this is very smelly. I don't like this, this isn't what I've been doing. Um, and kind of just learned on the job. Lived experience is so key. Um, and part of the role that I did at Lucky Generals as head of social impact was all of that. How do we bring the very essence of us in the day to day? And, and one of my biggest career championships will always be that Virgin Atlantic advert and the work that it's gone on, you know, to change nine airlines and counting. But let's really talk about where we were at. You know, three years ago, our industry got <coughs> put on its backside, as a lot of industries did. And we really had to think about the world in a real way. And I say that because whilst we were learning, the world outside was existing and continuing. And I think the disconnect got brought together when it got put on a global stage. And, you know, it wasn't the first time, but it started globally with the murder of George Floyd and then rippled. And, you know, we can talk about Black Square Summer, but we don't have enough time. Um, and we can talk about, as the first panel did, the tokenism and where people decided to do roles that were rooted in D and I. And even more than ever, cancel culture, whatever that might look like, in our industry became very, very loud, very real and very raw. And we stopped being accountable and we started being reactive. For this next generation of change makers who grew up in a world with choice and grew up in a world where they understood that who they are is something to be celebrated and not to be tapped down as maybe someone who's in my generation did, how can we get my group, I'm 40, um, but how can we get, you know, my group that are the ones that are sitting at that top level that really need to do the work and be the change, how can we get them to catch up to all of your points of this next generation who are going to come and be those change makers, are going to come and be the next CEOs, the next senior strategists, the next directors? What do we need to do and what do we need to learn to do the work? Um, I can take that. I think at any age, you're never to learn, old to learn. And I think that to get to a certain position, it can be celebrated and it should be celebrated, but with a very proactive, like, okay, I've, I've achieved this path, but I've achieved this level, like, let's keep the door open, let's keep proactive about it. And I find that um, you do tend to find like one person in that more senior position who is proactive, but everything is put onto that one person. So you get that emotional tax labor and that dependency and like, let me just have a casual conversation with you, but then dump a load someone new and take quotes and not give you any credit to it and expect you to get your work done by 5 p.m., etc. I think there needs to be adjustments and shifts and actually maybe some, if it's like you're doing more advising position, is it less client time, but then less client time means less pay, so companies also don't want to do that as well on the flip side. Um, of things, but I think younger people as well, outside of like, say the advertising creative sector is a box, those outside will create their content regardless, but those inside is where you get the slower progress and it's just not changing enough. And even me, I've had so many people saying like, oh, you do this outside, you do this, like, can we be dependent on you to give all this stuff? And I'm also like, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm like, my free time is my free time. I'll preserve that. Just because I can doesn't mean I shouldn't have to. Um, and I like to keep that clear boundary in between. But uh, yeah, I don't think that answers the question. <laughs> to uh, add to that, um, what comes with the beauty of, well, when we say choice, within the limits of choice mm -hmm. that we have, um, with young creatives and online platforms 
comes that sense of agency to be able to create what you want to create and put out into the world that makes sense to you, mm -hmm. which can be a very empowering feeling. And so mm -hmm. traditionalists need to appreciate how they can empower creatives, irrespective of age, to feel that they can share and bring their creativity, their talents, their skill sets, their experiences, their lived experiences to the table and also realize that quality content is not age dependent. Anyone can come yeah. up with good quality content and so respecting people irrespective of their educational background, socioeconomic status or experience in that sense is that mindset that needs to change in terms of where can talent come from? It's everywhere. And so how can we ensure that we are reaching talent in spaces that they don't tend to tap into? Mm -hmm. So it's sort of, that's another bridge that we need to cross. Yeah. And just to add on to that, there are people looking for people like you though. Mm -hmm. Like, please be aware of that. The likes of Innovate UK, which if any of you have notebooks, write them down, because <laughs> they have a Young Innovators Award, which was one of the first grants that I got that supported me in getting my first patent, uh, which is now licensed out globally. So that was a starting point, but that was open to everyone within a certain age bracket. It was irrelevant whether you'd been to university or whatever community you came from, it was open to everyone. But there are resources like the Prince's Trust, like Knowledge Transfer Network, these big organizations that are looking for people with ideas and talent because the creatives are the ones that are creating new things for the British economy, for the UK economy, which the government then benefits from. Let's not deny that. So there are benefits in the position that you're at, being creatives. Not everyone is wired to be creative. Yes, it's something you can nurture, but if it's something that comes naturally to you, you're an amazing resource, but you're someone that other people need. So please do not forget that. You talked about, you know, you mentioned the Prince's Trust and there are different ways and different routes, you know, that can, you can come into this industry. Um, but I guess the first place is kind of primary, secondary school. Do you, you know, not necessarily going through the traditional route, but what you see, you know, peers that you have alongside. And I guess to a lot of the people that are in the room that this is their actual career and it's the path they want to go on. Do you believe that, you know, we've got it right, that we're doing enough in that system um, to be able to champion this industry? You know, what... If you do, what are some of the great ones? And, and if you don't, what would you like to see? Yeah, so I'm currently working at the Helen Hamlin Center where we support various organizations to do with creativity, inclusivity, disability. And we're looking at rewriting curriculum and looking at how creativity can really be showcased as an asset as opposed to a pastime that sat there as relief within what's currently happening. Um, and it's a resource that benefits not just in the arts. Creativity is a process of problem solving. And hence why I sit now within disaster resilience design and get pulled into developing solutions to weird and wonderful problems that people don't necessarily understand. So creativity is something that should sit within everything taught at school. And that's now what we're looking at doing. But um, for me, I won't pretend. I did a BA and I did a master's. Um, and for me, they were the right things to do and they really worked for me and I am benefiting from them. But I'd been working and doing work experience from the age of 14 and from the age of three, started doing architectural drawings with my dad being a building surveyor. <coughs> so I had a bit of direction from him. Um, but the the university system worked for me and I saw every opportunity that was there and I really took it. And based on that, it's opened up the opportunities. But uh, yeah, I'd love to hear your experiences. Yeah. Um, for me, there were two points that I wanted to highlight in terms of where we're at and where potentially we should be headed in terms of career choices when it comes to career conversations with young people is the landscape of careers in itself is changing so rapidly. Mm -hmm. And so to keep up with that, 
we need to be uh, allowing young people to see the expanse of the kinds of careers that they can approach because there are so many different roles out there now. Things like I'm still figuring, I'm like still finding and discovering new roles within the industry, like movement coordinators, intimacy coordinators. There are so many different avenues within the same industry that you can find your niche in, or so many people are creating their own path. And so it's allowing young people to realize that they don't need to fall into traditional buckets of jobs, that they can tap into ones that they're perhaps not too familiar of, but that only comes with exposure to them and seeing role models in those sort of avenues as well, but not being afraid to create their own part that makes sense to them. And in that part, also realizing, coming to the second point, is that you don't need to have just one job. You don't need to have just one skill set to tap into. You can be multi-hyphenate and work several things. You can be a director and an editor. You can you know, work in front of the camera and behind the camera. There are so many ways to go about it. We as a society like to shoehorn people into pick a lane or do one thing. And Unfortunately, our fundings are that way as well. If you look at major fundings in the UK as well, there's funding for just a director. You can't be a director and something else. There has to be a producer fund. So it's sort of seeing how can we exist as people who does multiple things and allows for a culture that harnesses that kind of talent so that we can be multidisciplinary. I think within uh, education, there should be not only like internally in schools and system, etc., because ultimately school boards decide what they do and want, don't want to show based on funding, but also like our school opportunities, and not necessarily just in person, but like those online that other people can target and access, or paid media content on TikTok, or like TikTok pages that these like program stuff can like, then target all the right people and have it there and they can keep coming back to and resource. So I feel like that would be a great like, thing to see in uh, the future. And also in terms of skills, like one of the best tips I learned is that every skill is transferable um, and you can apply and reapply it absolutely um, everywhere, which I think there should be definitely more of a push off. Because I didn't know it's just uh, even existed until about maybe four years ago. I had no idea it was actually a role. And I was like, this is what I like to do for fun. I can get paid for this. Wow, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> People truly underestimate because yeah. even take someone creating a TikTok video, you're filming it, you're the cinematographer, you're the editor, you're yeah. the sound composer, you're adding, you're the director, you're editing it, you're uploading it, you're doing the marketing of it. There are all these so hats many behind that it. You, you wear in creating a piece of content that people don't realize that you can tap into and be paid for each skill set. So it's sort of really harnessing that and not allowing people to be forced to just pick one. I think there's, I think there's something so... Uh, powerful and beautiful and kind of what everybody is saying about learning but I think it's it's also um, something that I always say it's about understanding it's about truly understanding where you're at and so it's this idea that we live in a society that loves to label identity and loves to label what your role is and the definition of that you know my head of social impact role got transferred from the US and the definition of my role is very, very different because the nuance is different between the UK and the US. And then you go from one agency to another agency, they have a different viewpoint on it. And if they're competing agencies, then it never quite matches up and you try and find your counterparts. And so this understanding thing, I think, is the first place we need to come from when we talk about what it means to be a creative mm. because I am a chef. I'm also a writer, you know, I'm also, you know, mother and all these other identities that I carry, these other labels, they all make me uh, creative, but it's even in like some of the conversations and, and Rissi, you and I have had these conversations, I'm like, I'm also a cultural strategist, but I never knew what that was until I met other strategists and I was like, oh, <laughs> this is it. So I think there's something in that like, coming together as community, which our young creatives do on a social platform. They'll meet each other, they'll find collaborators, they'll follow together with. And um, I really wanted to talk to you, know, you Shiva and Rissi as two people who have founded your own initiatives. And as a new founder, like this thing that you said, you know, Rissi earlier is that we are always learning, we're never finished. There's always someone else that you can learn from. And, and you know, for me, gratefully, I can learn from both of you uh, for some context. They both play down their skills, so I'm not really gonna allow them to do it here. But um, 
Uh, so Shiva is incredible. Britain's got talent, France got talent, India's got talent, and created their directorial table called Queer Paraval, which was a South Asian love story through the trans experience. They are BAFTA nominated. It was previewed in 25 countries around the globe. Um, you know, uh, Flair here, Outfest in the US and so many others. Um, and what Shiva was able to do on that set um, was to bring an entirely South Asian experience from start to finish. So their crew, their safeguarding, all the people that they worked with. And that's groundbreaking. It's never been done in this industry before here in the UK. And they are under 30. Mm. Um, but one thing I want to highlight on that, that film, though, because the way we brought in 100 people from over 100 people from the global majority, 99% off of social media from my connections off of Instagram, TikTok, and stuff that we brought together in, and crowdfunded. So it's people online who made something tangible that could go on in a format like that. So just wanted to highlight the medium through which we got there. Um, but you're too much. Yeah, and you know, Rissy, for you, is this amazing strategist that's worked on some of the biggest campaigns that people have no idea that you did, you know, working with McCann and Nick's makeup for UK Black Pride and creating such a fundamental thing, but all the other work that you've then since gone on to do and Fax No Printer, which is this collective for juniors that have been doing this around the country and really influencing how juniors now take up space in the agencies mm. that they're in. To this point about creating it yourselves, what was your motivation is my first question. And then my second is what do you need next? Um, so I started advertising just when the pandemic started. So I didn't really have an expectation of what the culture of like a in office was to expect and how the cultural norms were. Because you might talk to someone senior, but you don't realize they're a CEO because you have no idea what these random letters really stand for. Um, and so I kind of broke down the barriers without uh, necessarily trying to, to just have that grasp of seeing like, okay, I could talk very directly and stuff. And so I feel like I wanted to keep that conversation going because when I would like make friends with like other juniors, not just in my company, they'd be like, oh no, don't do this and don't do that. But I'm like, but if you've got this raw opinion, then surely bounce off someone or et cetera and go X, Y, and Z. And so, um, Fax no printer. Uh, I had a friend of mine called Abby who I met through a WhatsApp group called Black Strat. And uh, we met through there, we connected. Another friend called Amal. And I was like, I have this idea. I want to create highlights on things happening in culture, especially we can all talk within our blackness as well um, and talk very like transparently, raw to the bone about these conversations the way they should be and not so cotton wool about it. So we went to work, went to town, and we went to like graft on it. Amal's an amazing designer. I said, whatever we do, as long as it looks good, um, you can sell it in, basically. And I think on our first week before putting out our first article, we already had 300 subscribers on MailChimp, um, which just absolutely blew up. And then we were able to do uh, live events at DNAD and at McCann as well this year. We had an event called Juniors of the New Seniors, where we crafted, connected juniors with some senior people that were amazing in the industry. We were like, you just have to meet them, and we're going to break down the barrier of LinkedIn, and we're just going to say, there you go, planted. Here's some questions that you can ask and bounce off, free food and everything, because I think that accessibility again. Um, I, I grafted really hard to get this fully funded so that people could just turn up and have a good time, have dinner, free wine, um, and leave a great connection with good vibes. So, and yeah, still love it today. Thank you. So I, I'm, the point of why I you know, raised that about you know, both of them and you know, Maddie, the same point to you is that we haven't gone through a route that went, this is the path. We've made our own path, and so I hope for a lot of you, what I'm trying to inspire in this conversation is whatever your path is, whether it is traditional or non-traditional, you can make absolute magic in this industry. This is what we want. Like this is what innovation and creativity looks like. You know, you're looking at three people who are doing things that are influencing the world, um, and that's the change that we want to see. And you're fresh. 
you know, you are not maybe where we're at, or at least I've burnt out is real, but you know, and some of us are still doing the work, but we're tired and we're carrying. We need your energy to do that. So um, on that note, I want to kind of speak to you in the room. Does anyone have any questions? Is there anything you want to ask anybody? Don't be shy. I'm seeing lots of smiles. <laughs> okay. Hi guys, thanks for that. It's so cool to hear all your different routes and the idea that you start out doing one thing and you end up doing something completely different. And I think this is definitely the way the industry is going and it's good for everyone to hear that. Um, I just wanted to come to your point, Chloe, on um, you know, burnout and just the fact that everyone's expected to put in so much work. And I wondered how you guys feel about trying to slow things down a bit and trying to make space for yourselves within your work and, and all that kind of thing? Um, I led with my work. I do a whole host of stuff. One of them is I'm an ambassador for Mental Health First Aid England. Um, and I had my first episode when I was 24. Um, and so one of the things that I've talked about for the last three years is exactly to your point. It's why I said, like, burnout is real. I'm not going to lie about who I am and where I'm at. I understand the body of work that I have to go through, but I can't afford to not speak my truth to myself. I have two small children. You can't come and kill me for those kids. Like, I, I wanna go home to them at night. And so part of how we truly change this industry is to stop pushing it into a box. We actually need to talk about it out loud. Like, this industry, creative industry, notoriously, takes people, chews them up, spits them back out, and then says, you have to work this out on yourself. And that's not real. If you take my skill set and you bring it to your business and we're going to do the work, then as safe as it can be, I'm going to hold you accountable to who I am in that space. And if you added that, um, and I can't be, everyone can't be me, but I guess that's why I got put in the positions that I am in to give my experience and bring others who have a shared lived experience. But um, yeah, I'm not gonna not talk about it anymore. Not when we all know and everyone just wants to be silent. I have enough of that in other parts of my life. I'm not sure about anybody else. Which, as, go ahead. I'd just love to add straight onto that because I, I've worked within the architecture industry for quite a while, and whilst I was there, there was almost this glorification of overworking, where they would say, if you're there after 8 p.m., order in some food, we'll sort you out a taxi back home. And you're like, as a, a student, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> but really looking at it, it wasn't right. And it created this really toxic culture for myself where as soon as I felt like I was in the right position, I had to give everything. Um, and I, I'm absolutely a people pleaser. It's why I've got one company where I was asked to make it. Um, and the second business, the Cross Design Studio, I support other people in setting up their first ventures and bringing their products to market because I know how much it matters. But setting those boundaries is something I'll constantly be working on. And I don't think I've found the right boundaries yet, but I'm really happy with the boundaries I'm choosing right now because I'm doing it for the right reasons where it's working. It's building up what I need it to. And I love it. I love what I do. So whilst I'm enjoying it, I'll put everything into it. And when I feel like I've got to make choices, then I'll reflect on that. As an extension to what's been said, I think when you're creating stuff on your own and you're like in that space, it can be very isolating sometimes. And there's a lot of mental pressure in terms of thinking about the whole life cycle of a project right from inception. So what I tend to do is lean on my community. <laughs> I think without my queer community, my siblings, these people here, without them, I would not have been able to navigate that sort of anxiety-inducing um, situations and um, events. So community, bringing people that help you, even if just like some of them are like sounding boards, can you help me look at this, can you check this, can I check in with you? Having that unit can really empower you and strengthen yourself and the process. And also as a mental health first aider myself as well, it's so important for me to ensure that environment is created for 
everyone else that I'm bringing into my space, so whatever project, like the film sets that we have, to ensure that everyone else is looked after, whether it's sticking to the hours that are set, not going over time, yeah. but paying people for anything extra, ensuring that they're well fed, they're looked after, there's a therapist on standby, there are resources available to them even before they come into that space so that they feel supported, connected, and able to bring their best into that space. So I think it's a whole 360 of looking after yourself so that you can look after everyone else that you're working with as well. Yeah. Um, not much to add on that. I think you've all said it perfectly, but I would say clear communication whenever you can. Um, I struggle um, sometimes with speaking, and so I won't necessarily speak in a meeting, but you can write your notes afterwards. And, but I'm also aware of what I can and, and can't do, especially being like, neurodivergent. So whenever I go to a room, like you said, like, I'm very much starting on time, finishing on time, taking things by uh, slots, and making sure everyone else is aware of that. But I think even if you don't have these specific requirements, um, it's important to still do them as well, so it makes it easier for those who do need these accessible um, uh, needs so they can have peace of mind um, to give them that extra relief and freedom. So it's to help others by helping yourself and, yeah. I love the point on clear communication. Because oh, good, sometimes it's so hard yeah. to speak up and be like, I'm feeling a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so creating that culture where you can speak your truth and be honest about it and not be judged or yeah. penalized for it is so important. Thank you. It goes a long way. Thank you, that was a really awesome question. We've only got a few minutes left, um, so I wanted to end on actually something that you've all just said, but you very nicely filled up. Thanks for picking out my brain. Um, chosen family, community, network, whatever that term might look like, I am only as great as the people that I have around me. I've only been able to have the opportunities that I've had because of an ability to network and meet other people. All three of you have done that in lots of different iterations. And it's so powerful that I have been able to do, like you said, a job that I've loved by, you know, someone said, I've seen this role, I think you'll be great for it, you should go for it within my network. Or I went through my LinkedIn and I was like, okay, I've just founded my own business, what do I need? And I was like, oh, this person, this person, like the power of your network is so powerful to having people that you could talk to, but also people that might be able to champion you and help elevate your business for the better. So what's your top networking tip that you know, people in the audience could take away with them? And please make sure you come and speak to all of us. Like, don't be afraid. If there's someone that you want to meet here and you've seen them, just go up and talk to them. We should all be really friendly. That's why we're here. <laughs> I would say, me personally, no one's going to take this, but I said keep it casual at first. Like, you can be very senior, but sometimes it's nice to just be like, hey, nice to meet you. I saw this talk that you did, or this is really great. It doesn't have to be a diss uh, kind of vibe. Um, it just casual makes it accessible, and it sets a tone for that conversation. Um, even if it's just messaging someone on LinkedIn and just saying, you really like this, blah, blah. You don't have to ask for any job role or a meeting. You can just build a simple connection from that and then come back to it when you want to have more of a conversation. Um, what I've realized that works for me, and I recommend this to everyone and almost every panel that I am <laughs> on, is that we as storytellers, or anyone for that matter, we consume so much on a daily basis, whether that's news, whether that's stories, whether that's information, A, it's checking where we get that information from. We're constantly doom scrolling, we're constantly getting, feeding ourselves with so much. So being mindful of what we're bringing into our daily lives who are we following? Can we follow diverse voices so that we can learn about their experiences, their stories, that filter into our feed that, that is curated in that way specifically so that it becomes part of your daily conversation. You get exposure to different lived experiences. You get empowered to learn about them, to speak about them, but also to reach out and see how you can benefit from those experiences. So the way I've done it is, again, following different people, different people who are killing it, who are doing absolutely amazing works in different fields, in different backgrounds, different experiences, so that I'm expanding my own worldview. I'm opening up myself to different avenues, but also seeing different people, it's so much easier to just a like, a share, championing someone that something someone's doing, sending them a DM, really love your work, building that connection slowly as well, so that eventually in the future, if it's something that you can tap into, it's readily there. But it only starts with 
us looking at what we're consuming on a base level because that itself narrows so much of what we do in our network. And for me, it really comes back to the really kind of human aspects of it, going back to building trust and having empathy with people and really coming to understand what other people are looking for. So there are loads of people in my network that I've helped them, supported them at a different point, and they come back to me and say there's an opportunity. I don't know that's going to happen, but I'm there doing the same for other people. I want to help other people thrive, and that's why all of us are here. And it's why I hope if anyone's interested in what we're doing, please do come and say hello, because we're here to try and help as much as possible. We're not trying to gatekeep this information. We want more people to be pushing the boundaries of the creative industry and shaking things up, because my goodness, does it need it. But that's why we're all here. And, and we're not finished. Like, I want to learn from everybody. I don't know everything. Um, so I want to thank my amazing panelists. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I want to thank you all for listening. Um, you have another incredible panel coming up. So please make sure that you come back and listen to that one. And also make sure that you download the research. Some of us got to impart that. And it's really an incredible body of work. So please make sure that you have a look at that. And thank you, Chloe, oh, for this yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, it's Have an amazing day, everyone. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you.